Hey, you little chicken nuggets. I have some dating advice for y'all. And since I'm single as ever, (laughs) I'm literally the most qualified person to give some dating advice. (laughs) Yes, I am. Okay then, communicate everything. Don't expect them to be something they ain't. If they disrespect you, leave. Apologies go a long way. So say you're sorry. Sorry. 99% of the time, the only difference between being good friends and dating someone is physical touch. My suggestion would be to master the side hug before moving on to the full hug. Wait to say I love you. When you think it's the right time, it's probably not. Wait a little longer. Because once you say I love you, you can't take it back. Trust me. And last but not least, if you're dating a person and they're pressuring you to do something that you're not okay with, my suggestion would be to karate chop them in the face and then run away. It works really good. No one likes to be chopped in the face. No one. All right, that was my advice for all you knuckleheads in a current relationship. If I were to give my real advice, I urge all of y'all to be single because being single is cool beans, y'all. Think of all the groovy people out there that accomplish so much by being single rather than being in a relationship. For example, Sir Isaac Newton. He's the guy that discovered that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. The Wright brothers were single and they were too busy flying over all the lame couples. So what I'm saying is that if you're single, you can literally fly. Probably. And Beethoven, the guy that literally invented music. And after hearing of those cool single people, and you're still like, Carl, my dude, I dig the dating game. Being single is whack. Well, I counter that argument with this. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, heard of him? He was super single. Game, set, match point. Single people. That video that you just watched, it's actually more aimed towards teens, so that's the reason that it has more of a feel of teenish. But I, I love what it says because today's message is all about relationships. Uh, I'm just going to give you a, a heads up, a warning. If you have kids, just understand that we, are, we have been going through this series of chapter by chapter through the, through the letter of 1 Corinthians. I am so glad that we have kids ministry. I'm giving you a disclaimer. Uh, you know, today's topic it might make you a little bit squim. Uh, uncomfortable. Uh, So with that being said, singles, married noobs, married veterans, this is all advice for all of us. Um, I think it's fair to say that we can all use relationship advice wherever we're at in life. But one thing that is incredibly important is to be careful who you are getting advice from, right? We all have those friends that want to give us advice on relationships. They want to tell us how we should live in relationships. And sometimes it's like terrible advice. Working within the church It's interesting hearing about some of the advice that people get from friends regarding their marriage, regarding their relationships. And sometimes it's friends, sometimes it's counselors, and even crazier is sometimes it is people that claim to be of Christ that are giving this advice. At times you will have people who are having relationship issues that will go to secular counselors to give them faulty advice. They encourage these people to do whatever makes them happy. You might be saying, that's great advice. We're going to talk about this. It's terrible advice. What ends up happening is that you end up with people running away from their issues, and they're still carrying the baggage. It gives the impression that they're happy because they're not dealing with the issues that they had at the moment, but the issue is they're bringing it to every single relationship that they're in. The baggage didn't go away. It's still there. A piece of advice that I often hear from people getting from their friends is, trust your heart. Follow your heart. Let me just put it this way. That's the most unbiblical piece of advice that you could get, especially coming from a Christian. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. And then Jeremiah poses a question, who really knows how bad it is? Like, do you really know how bad your heart is? I can attest from past experiences, and maybe you can too, that following your heart is a dangerous way to make decisions. And if if you've had those scenarios, you understand it's not a very good way to understand what is right and wrong. The heart is misleading. Feelings are misleading. So when it comes to relationships, they are tricky because what do we trust? If we can't trust our feelings, if we can't trust our happiness, if we can't trust our heart, then what do we trust? Culturally speaking, commitment 
in relationships, go as far as your feelings go, right? As soon as my feelings end, that's where I'm done. And it's probably not meant to be, right? That's what we think, because I'm not feeling those butterflies anymore. So this is the reason that many marriages end in divorce. Perfectly normal culturally, extremely objectionable biblically. This is not me speaking. Jesus said that in the Sermon of the Mount. He he talks about divorce. There are many things that can happen culturally in our environments that can start to become common practices within the church as well, which is what we're seeing, right? At the same time, there can be biblical principles that can be stretched and they become risky ideas as well. So there's good things, but sometimes good things within the church get stretched. And sometimes they're very liberal, kind of like it doesn't really matter. So seven weeks ago, we began on this series, Toxic Church, as we began to go through each chapter, as I stated, right, of the first letter to the Corinthians. There's two letters, the first Corinthians, second Corinthians. This series is about the first letter to the Corinthians. So each chapter is addressing, correcting, and encouraging the believers to live in light of the gospel that they accepted, which is important to note, right? We often think that the Bible is just here to make us feel good. This whole letter is addressing the issues within people's lives. And as a church, we're not going to shy away from that. This was one chapter that I could honestly say, I wish I had a pass, you know, a hard pass, just so I wouldn't have to go through it because this topic makes me a little bit uncomfortable to speak in front of a lot of people. And here's the thing, but it's important. It's relevant. Paul has been addressing, when, when you look at this letter, you could say, well, he's talking to people that are lost. No, he started the, the letter by saying, to the believers in Corinth. It's to people who claim to be of Christ. And within the church, there was actually divisions, immaturity, spiritual pride, sexual immorality. There was disputes. And there was question, questions that the believers had in regards to trying to discern what is right from wrong. How should I respond in this? How should I conduct myself in light of the gospel? So as we get to the seventh chapter, we come to a question that is posed regarding marriage and sexual relations, which are great questions to ask considering this, that marriage is not a social construct. So if you're not familiar with what a social construct is, it is something that exists not in objective reality. In other words, it's not something that is there because it was meant to be there but it is a result of human interaction. It exists because humans agree that it exists. So let me put it this way. What we do is sometimes we assume that the things that exist in life are almost like this little tower, right? We, we build on these things. These are ideas that we came up with. And this is an argument that exists, right? That this is created by us, marriage, morality, even religion and faith. We just assume that we're the ones that built this. People will argue that these ideas or practices are out of touch, out of date, or exist because people thought thought about this throughout time and they have adopted them as generally good ideas, marriage being one of them. Which means that if humans constructed this idea, it can actually quickly be deconstructed, right? So we could just continue to move these things around. Because we created them, so we're able to maneuver them to make it fit our life, make it fit what we want, which presents ideas or presents issues. If we created these ideas and there is no foundation, because the foundation just exists because we created it, as soon as it starts moving, it collapses. All your ideas. As soon as you start messing with those ideas, something is going to fall. Unless... It was established by God himself. Then all of a sudden it makes sense. This is not a social construct. This is a God-made construct. This is something that God intended it to be. And as we start to question these things, whether they're socially constructed or God-constructed, it brings up many questions. The questions that you may have to answer is, if God is created by man or man created by God, which one is it? Or is the Bible inspired by God and written by men? Or is it written by man and inspired for people to believe in God? Which one is it? Because it's ultimately going to define your views in life. How you see this ultimately will define how you see marriage, how you see faith, how you see morality. 
Is morality absolute? Is marriage something that God intended it to be and established it for a purpose? And if the answer is this, which is what we believe, and we're going to hold on to this belief, no matter who you are, what you try to tell us that you believe, we're going to hold on to this belief. And that is that God created man and he gave instructions for man that were written by man for the purpose of giving us a foundation with principles for application in our life that would spare us of pain and help us to understand the life that he called us to live. That is what we believe. And I don't care if you turn blue and you tell me that it's something different. We're not going to adhere to that belief. Because we believe that the Bible is fundamentally true. We don't believe that marriage is a social construct. But a constructed idea by the one who created humanity. Culturally, we would like to assume that marriage is something that society created and has simply been traditionally done. So it can easily be changed. However, marriage is biblical and more importantly, constructed and fundamentally established by God since the moment of creation. And just like I said, the moment that you undermine that foundation, that you try to undermine what marriage is, everything else will fail. Your relationship with your kids will fail. Your relationships with others will fail. Everything fails when you undermine what God established. And we see that God established marriage in the garden. God creates man and woman. And marriage is established. We see it in the garden. God makes man and creates a suitable partner for him, woman. And if this idea seems outdated, or maybe like Jesus doesn't really believe that, let me just turn your attention to the book of Matthew, where he talks about this. In Matthew chapter 19, he actually, Jesus goes back to the account of creation. If you think that it's outdated, this, these are the words of Jesus. Haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus said, replied. They record that from the beginning, there's a beginning, God made them male and female. We understand there's two genders. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his mother, father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since there are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. So two genders are created. And between the two, there is a union that exists. Adam and Eve were the first humans created. They didn't have biological parents, as you may already well know that. But did you catch what it said in that passage? This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. Did you catch that? That this is an idea for a man and a woman that were created that had no parents. This is something that is established for the rest of creation. And just like we talked about last week, there is something that happens in marriage. There is a union through marriage when, people, when two people come together as one. And maybe you're catching the drift where I'm going, but verse 16, I'll just take you back to the previous chapter, 1 Corinthians 6, 16. Uh, it says, don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one with her body. It's talking about a very unique union. There are certain things that, can come, that come with marriage. <sighs> Throughout the week, as I was preparing for this message, I was looking for a word that wouldn't make me or you feel uncomfortable. Uh, but the whole chapter, like I said, talks about this, and it is sex. It is a union between two people. And it is to be had within the confines of marriage, not outside of it, which is what we believe. And we will stand firm on that. There is nothing more emotionally, mentally, and physically binding than this. Think about it. There's nothing that is more binding. In the last chapter, Paul started to address the issues with sexual immorality within the church. And also in general, right? There's issues that come with sexual immorality. And in this chapter, he is addressing a question that was asked regarding sexual relations. So this is how the chapter, chapter seven starts. Now, regarding the questions you asked in your letter, by the way, we don't know what those questions are. He's just simply referencing to them, but he answers it. Yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations. But because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. The husband 
should fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's sexual needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. So there's a lot in that passage, but let me just start off by starting where he finished in, in this passage that we're going to tackle. I say this as a concession, as an allowance, not as a command. So there is a distinction between a command and a concession. A command is something that you should do. That's something that you're told to do. A concession is something that is granted in response to a demand. In other words, this is something that is allowable. This is something that is permissible. And Paul is trying to help them understand the bigger picture of sexual activity in the lives of believers. And after reading that passage, if you start to feel as though sexual relations should be treated as leisure or casual, you know, it it starts to feel that way. Like we may just be property in a relationship to be used to satisfy each other's fantasies. Maybe that's how it starts to feel, that it starts to come across. But starting at the beginning of the chapter, let me go back to how we started. Sometimes we just take one verse and run with it. Let me go back to the beginning of the chapter. Yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations. He's answering the question. He's saying, it is best if you aren't acting upon these things. So sexual relations aren't something to be done casually. Remember that this act is one that joins two people together. It is of great significance. However, keep in mind that the Corinthians are also living in a pagan culture, in a pagan society, with cultural practices of sexual immorality that are worming their way into the church. There's issues within the church. That's what Paul keeps on addressing. There's a lot of issues, and we have to tackle these things, which is what follows. He says, because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. He's addressing the issue. He's saying, hey, there's issues in your culture. Even though it's best to refrain from this, it is best to engage in a biblical perspective, in a biblical concept. So there's an issue with a society where sexual relations have become a relationship norm. It's part of every relationship. Go back to chapter 5 of Corinthians. If you, don't, if you weren't here, just go ahead and read that. It, you don't have to get very far into that chapter. There's an issue with a man and his stepmother. So Paul instructs a husband to have their own wife and wives to have their own husband and fulfill each other's needs. To engage in this act in the way that God intended it to be within the confines of marriage. And here's the thing. Yes, God instituted both marriage and sexual relations. As we see in the beginning, we don't only see the establishment of marriage, but we also see that creation is given a command to be fruitful and multiply. Right? There's two things that are created by God. They're instituted by God. Once again, this is meant to take place within the boundaries of marriage. It is not only a method of multiplying, But as Paul continues, he also addresses that this is a part of gratification and satisfaction. And culture is making it something permissible with all. Paul is saying, have it within the confines of what it was created to be within, within marriage. So he is encouraging the believers that even though it is better to abstain from sexual relations, it is best to be active within the confines of marriage so that it will not become an area where the devil, Satan, will tempt you and take you down. The only time that he says to refrain from it is when both people, both partners, husband and wife, agree, and it should be for the purpose of committing yourself to prayer, committing yourself to God. And afterwards, after that time is done, you should come together again so that the devil doesn't use this as an area of temptation to cause you to sin. In the first uh, in first Peter, the chapter five, verse eight, it actually warns us. It says, Stay alert. 
Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Have you ever watched footage of a lion like on the prowl? You know, it's looking for its prey. The lion doesn't make himself known until the prey is at its most vulnerable state and its biggest disadvantage. I think most times we feel confident that we will be able to see how the devil is planning to take us down. But the reality is that a lion prowls in such a stealthy way, which is what prowl is, in such a stealthy way that you won't know where he is going to attack from until it's too late. That's the reason that we're told, stay alert. Make sure that you're, you're on guard. The other misconception that we have as Christians is that the devil will only use the things in our lives to attack us, right? The things that are close to us. But the reality is that he will also use the things that we don't have and he'll give us a desire to want those. So it'll put us at a disadvantage for the purpose of devouring us. The devil will use any vulnerability in our lives to corrupt what God established, which is what we're seeing, right? God, God uses the good things that God created and he turns them to bad. He turns them to sin. He turns them to wickedness. And here's the thing. You don't have to look back to the church in Corinth to see this taking place. You will see this taking place within the church, people claiming to be Christians. You will see it taking place around us within the secular perspective and even within the cultural church. Marriage is being corrupted from what God established it to be. The way that the church in Corinth viewed sexual relations was no different than how our culture views it. It's simply a tool. It's simply something that we just do because it's traditionally been done that way. Look around and you will see that the devil has used our vulnerabilities to corrupt what God established. God designed and established all these things for good, for fulfillment, for purpose, But the devil has used them as a tool of wickedness to bring the depravity into the lives of people, to bring empty satisfaction. And the devil has fed us a lie that there is no purpose in sexual sexual relationships outside of gratification. That's all that they serve. That's all that they're there for. At times we see what the devil has made of sex in our culture. So we begin to wonder not only if we should abstain from sexual activity completely, but some even take it a little bit further and wonder if marriage is something that they should completely abstain from. This can be something that an individual decides because they're like, I just don't want to sin in any way. Or maybe it's a commitment that you have to make to the church. Within the Catholic Church, there's a vow that is taken known as the vow of celibacy to abstain from marriage and sexual activity, sexual relations. And this chapter actually gives us some context as to why some may choose to take this vow. Verse 7 continues by saying, But I wish everyone were single just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it is better to stay unmarried just as I am. But if they can't control themselves... They should go ahead and marry. It is better to marry than to burn with lust. Now, this sounds a little bit crazy, to be honest. You know, because considering that this is how we actually multiply, and Paul's encouraging everybody who is single and widowed to stay that way, you know, not, not to marry. But Paul is saying that his desire is for people who aren't married to stay single, and the widows to do the same. And at the end of the chapter, he will clarify. He's going to clarify why. And we're going to come back to that as as we're about to wrap it up. But we'll come back to that. But again, he goes back to the weakness of the flesh, right? This is a reality that exists in 100% of us, myself included. We all have weakness of the flesh, and Paul is continuing to address. There's a weakness that exists in each one of us, and we have to be careful. We have to be on guard. We have to be alert and make sure that we are staying Vigilant because the devil is always going to attack in our most vulnerable areas. Once again, biblically speaking, multiplication is possible. Being fruitful and multiplying is possible through the action of sexual uh, engagement. 
But if we remain single for the sake of not sinning, but it's still going to cause us to sin, why would we stay that way? And Paul says that, you know, if it, it is better for you to marry than to burn with lust. And at times this passage can be taken to the extreme and people will make that vow that gives the appearance of spiritually principled people, but it ends up giving the devil a foothold to drag the individual to places that they never thought that they would end up at. And I don't think I'm speaking anything new when I say we see this, right? People who abstain from getting married, but then we see the issues that come because of it. I am not speaking in ignorance. I am not speaking carelessly. I am simply speaking about the reality of the human nature. Sexual immorality is not just something that can happen within churches that take that vow of celibacy. It can happen within any church at a moment of weakness. At any church. Nobody is exempt from this. We are all broken individuals and we are all capable of doing the things that we believe we are incapable of when we allow areas in our life to become open areas for the devil to attack from and creep into. This is the reason that Paul writes to fulfill each other's needs within the confines, within the boundaries of marriage. And regarding celibacy, he says each person has a special gift from God. This is not something that everybody is going to accept. This is not something that everybody is able to do. So not everyone can accept this life of celibacy. And not everyone is called to it. So if you're here today, or if you're listening online, and you are single, and maybe the Single life is not what you chose, but the single life chose you, just like with Cole Carl in the opening clip. I want to wrap it up by telling you that I know some single people. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, I, I, just, I, I just want to wrap it up by saying this. Going back to scripture, right? What is scripture trying to tell us? For those who are single, for those who are married, and right now, Paul is talking about the single life, right? So Paul continues in his letter by addressing why it is best to remain single. And this may not give you comfort if you're single at the moment, but don't want to be single. Uh, But hopefully it can help you to gain a different perspective of where you're at right now. But before I go any further, since we're talking about single people, I want to encourage you that if you are in that stage of life where you are single, I want to encourage you to continue to pursue purity in the midst of waiting. Because that's what Paul's talking about, right? He's saying, hey, sexual activity is to be had within the confines of marriage. So I I encourage you, continue to live in light of the gospel that you accepted. But then in verse 32, Paul writes, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. There's the explanation. That's why Paul is saying, hey, it's better if you remain single. So this is, this is probably the hardest part for me to speak about, just because it is very personal. But I, I'm talking about this because I want you to understand it from a personal perspective. Shortly after going into full-time ministry, I actually quickly realized how difficult it is to be a devoted husband, a devoted dad, a devoted pastor, a devoted employee, a devoted friend, it it is difficult because each one almost requires complete attention when we're talking about spiritual uh, spiritual, uh, principles. To put it as straightforward as possible, and, and, and this is extremely blunt, and this is not saying that I wish it was different. I'm just simply telling you what it is for what it is. I quickly realized how difficult it was to be married, to have children, and to be a pastor, and to do as much as I wanted to do for the sake of the gospel. 
I realize how difficult it is. Because I, I feel like I'm failing constantly. Whether it's at being a pastor, at being a husband, at being a dad, at being a friend, being a listening ear. And once again, I wouldn't have it any other way, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second, but the reason that Paul says that it is best not to be married makes a whole lot of sense to me now. Maybe prior to being in in ministry, I wouldn't have understood it the same way, but here is the reality. I know I wouldn't be in ministry as well if I couldn't be married. So I would never take the vow of celibacy because I understand that I couldn't and that I shouldn't. And to take it even further, I actually would have thrown in the towel at pastoring a long time ago had it not been for my wife. Because there are people that are encouraging, but I am telling you there is nobody that is more sacrificially encouraging than my wife. So to me, when I think about marriage within the confines of ministry, I know that I need my partner, my suitable partner, my wife, to be there encouraging me. Personally speaking, in general, I don't know that I could continue to do ministry without having a supportive wife. But being married has presented many challenges, and and that's just a reality of it. Because in the midst of trying to be all things to all people, I often fail at being all things to all people to the people within my house. Because I have earthly responsibilities that at times end up colliding with spiritual desires and responsibilities. It is not that my family trumps God by any means, and they know that. We, we talk about this. But I have a responsibility to manage my own household to some extent before I can effectively manage this household. And it's stressful at times, actually most times. And I feel like a failure a majority of the time. The reason that Paul is saying that he wishes he could remain single is for the benefit of what can be accomplished for the kingdom of God with as little distractions and restrictions in your life as possible. The things that may restrict us are not bad. For me, the things that restrict me from doing some more things within the church, they're very good. It's spending time with my kids. It's being with my supportive wife. It's being with my family. Those are good things. I'm not saying that they're bad but they do restrict. And it's not that my kids are a burden. They're far from that. If you don't hear anything else today, understand that my kids are far from a burden to me. I would stand up to any of you for the sake of my kids. My kids are not the issue. My wife is not the issue. The issue is that there is a desire within me to do more for the kingdom, but there is a divided allegiance in a way. I have a responsibility to be the head of the household while I have a responsibility to take care of the church. Marriage is incredible. As a matter of fact, Ephesians 5.32 tells us that marriage paints a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. But But I also see it from a different perspective. If you are single and you are trying to see the silver lining of where you are at in life, let me put it this way. An undivided life frees you to live a solely devoted life. So if you're trying to see where the good is in being single, this is it. You're not divided in interest. You are able to be solely devoted to your faith. Relationships are an incredible part of life. But as someone who has the opportunity to serve God within the church in a full-time capacity, there is nothing more eternally and satisfying and rewarding than emptying yourself every single day of the things of this world for the sake of the gospel. There is nothing more eternally rewarding. If you are single, live fully in the moment, emptying yourself of every minute for the sake of the kingdom. If God calls you into a relationship that honors him within the confines of marriage, take it. If that is what you desire, take it if the opportunity presents itself. This passage dove deeper into relationships and to how, how to approach him. There's a lot of verses that we had to kind of skip over. It wasn't done intentionally, but we just didn't have the time. But if you're here, I want to encourage you. We have our life group afterwards. I promise you we can dive deeper into it. If you want to stay afterwards, just let us know that you're staying so that we have enough food for everybody that stays. But 
I, I'm telling you, there's so much incredible, there, there's so many incredible passages to go to that help us to understand what relationships were created to be. Epicenter, God created you with a purpose and all the things he established, he established for your good, for a purpose, for satisfaction as we press deeper into him, the creator of all things. Oftentimes people will look to certain Bible verses to adopt a radical idea that ultimately ends up crippling us spiritually. Other times people completely disregard it without understanding the context as to which it was given. Church, care and invest into your relationship. And if you are not there, or you are trying to figure out maybe if God is calling you into a relationship, use this time that you are single to devote yourself to the kingdom. Trust me, you can do so much for the kingdom of God. And even if you're married, you can do a lot for the kingdom of God. Trust me, I see it in my own life. And not that I've done everything that's far from what I was saying. I'm just saying it's possible. It's just a matter of who you're committed to in your spare time. Empty yourself of this life. Invest your life into another person. The best advice for any relationship is not found in any other self-help book. It is simply found in the book that contains the words of the one that created you for a purpose. Let's pray.